what's in this picture. And I have to introduce a couple of concepts before I can get to this. So um, let me first uh, describe what's uh, called, um, what is termed wave front. Have people heard the word wave front before? Yes, no? Let me show you the graphical representation of a wave front. So I have this a simulation of a wave. Oops. Um, it's a, it's a simulation, but I, I, you know, this is a reminder of something that you have seen many times before. Water waves. Imagine you have a tub of water, you keep dropping water, you see water waves forming across it, right? And um, maybe, I don't know if you look at it from top, it'll look like this. But what you definitely can say is that if you turn it around, then what that wave is, it's a, it's a variation of the water level. There's a, some particular level that the water would be at if there was no drop at all, right? And as the, um, the water drops, disturbs the water, it uh, causes this ripple, okay? So uh, what I want to call wave front, it's uh, very similar to what you see here um, in the top view. So in the top view, you are not really seeing something that's oscillating up and down, right? But what they are using, the graphical tool that they're using to illustrate that is um, they have some point that they are marking as a dark spot, right? And it almost doesn't matter if this dark spot is a high point in the wave or a low point in the wave. What matters is that it's a point, a consistent point in the wave. So if I switch back to the other view where the wavy nature is more clear, I would be looking at, let's say, this point of the wave. And as I track this uh, one particular point of the wave that has the same phase, that's the same portion of the cycle of the periodic wave, that's what we call wave front. So, um, so it's a terminology, it's a way of graphically illustrating waves so that um, we don't need a fancy simulation to illustrate wave when we want to. Um, and that's uh, what you see in this diagram here. This is, uh, so these lines, these lines are representing a wave front. As in, imagine you have an electromagnetic wave that's oscillating and this is a particular point on that um, electromagnetic wave oscillation. Maybe this is the point where electric field was pointing most out of the board. And then it'll, you know, it'll cycle, it'll sort of get smaller, point into the board, and then get smaller again. And it, when it points out of the board again, this is the next wave front. So from wave front to, to wave front, that would be one wavelength. Yeah. So, um, so that's the graphical tool, and I guess, oh, 50 minutes, oh, that's more than I thought. Um, I guess so since I have this picture from the textbook, might as well use it. So this is the drawing, oops, how do I, how do I get rid of, I don't know if, mm. Mm. I want to get rid of the top while zooming in. I don't know, oh, I know what I can do. Because this is an open book, I can do things like just copying image address, just to displaying the image. Um, commercial textbooks makes that really hard for you because they're trying to prevent you from copying. Um, then you don't worry about it, actually it's a better product. So, um, so this is an illustration of that. Uh, let's take a little bit of time just to dissecting this picture. Some portion of it you are already, I mean, you can guess what it is. You can guess that this is the ray of light and this is the ray of light bending as it goes into water, right? Um, these wave fronts, they take a little bit of uh, more explanation. So this wave front picture is added to, imagine you have a not a, not a very narrow ray of light, but imagine this is more like a flashlight that's uh, covering a wide area that's uh, just coming in. So you could, I could take this picture and just uh, 
through it parallel side to side. So this is all the bunch of rays that are in that wide beam. And I can illustrate that beam with a, its propagation direction, or I can illustrate that with this wave front. If we are dealing with a plane wave, as in a wave as it's moving, the only direction in which electric field is changing is the direction it's moving in. The, if you go in any other direction, the, the electric field remains the same. Then this is the set of points which have the same electric field. Oops, sorry, I'm using wrong color. Um, so these are the set of points in space where at a particular moment in time, electric fields have the same magnitude and direction. Yeah? And at that same moment in time, you can actually find another set of points that have the same magnitude and direction of electric field as here. That's the next uh, wave front. And um, we are dealing with the periodic waves here. That's why these same values of electric field occur over here. And if you go same spacing over, you would see the same values of electric field occur again. And so on, and so on, and so on. Right? So um, this is spacing between these two. That's what we call wavelength. So it's an um, illustration of wavelength in a, a way that maybe you haven't seen before. Um, I don't think I covered this when we do physics for a. Um, yeah, but it, it, this makes sense in terms of diagram, yes? Now, um, let's say this is a light of a particular frequency. So it has some amount of fixed frequency. Um, so it's a light with, let's say, frequency f. Then, um, then we, we know an expression for exp uh, what this wavelength is, right? For a periodic traveling or periodic wave, um, wave speed c is equal to wavelength times frequency. So if you solve it for wavelength, that ought to be um, equal to wave speed c, speed of light in vacuum or air, divided by the frequency. That's the wavelength here. As this light enters a different medium, what changes? Does the, um, does the frequency change? No. The assumption, yeah. So in most of the cases involving optics, the assumption which is true most of the time is that frequency is determined at the source. If I have some charge that's uh, oscillating at one hertz, and that's producing an electromagnetic wave, then as this light goes through many other places, it's going to remain oscillating at one hertz. Um, one exception that will come later is something called the Doppler effect, but let's not worry about it now. <laughs> so, so the frequency at the source determines what the frequency will be here also. So as you look at this expression, if we are saying frequency of light doesn't change as it enters water, can the wavelength stay the same? No, right? Because the wave speed is decreasing. So if frequency is the same, then the wavelength must be smaller. And that's what this picture is saying. Plus uh, one additional condition that I hope you will find intuitively true in a rigorous way, not you know, just uh, I know it to be true. Um, and that's this. So imagine that, um, imagine that we are obstinate and we say, we insist that this light is going to uh, remain, uh, keep going straight, not bend, right? Then um, this, is the, uh, this is the difficulty that you see as you, kind of draw what the, uh, the light, how the light looks like. So the ray, whether you draw it straight or bent, doesn't look like anything's wrong yet. So the inconsistency comes in when you draw the wavefront. 
So I, um, I have these wavefronts in air, right? Let me draw just one more here. So these are the wavefronts in air. In water, if I'm going to draw wavefronts, this is how it's going to look with this purple line here. So the wavefront will still be perpendicular to the propagation direction. So it goes in this direction. Now, if I connect it this way, that's, that's wrong. Because then I'm saying that the wavelength here is the same as the wavelength here. We just talked over that that's not the case. So if I draw it the other way with a shorter wavelength, then this is what I get. And this is wrong for a different reason. What you are seeing is a uh, discontinuity here, right? Uh, what's wrong with the you know, wave front not being continuous? What's wrong with the wave front just jumping from here to here as you cross the boundary? Yeah, you know, I think that's a good starting point. Whenever in physics, whenever you see something that's discontinuous, the first thing you should be is suspicious. Sometimes that can happen. Uh, in fact, in quantum mechanics, sometimes you will see when something is discontinuous. But anything that's discontinuous, as a matter of presumption, it's uh, unnatural. <laughs> you don't have. You don't usually see that in physics. Here, the way you might justify this, based on knowing that these are based on electric fields is discontinuity in wavefront represents discontinuity in electric field. The value and direction of electric field here is in some direction. And as you cross this boundary, um, the electric field is suddenly changing. And if you have done application of Gauss's law in an upper division setting, you would notice that that corresponds to having some charge density here. And I did not want to deal with the charge density here. I'm not dealing with the static electricity. So, so this is a rule that we use in optics. The wave front has to be continuous as you go across the boundary. That's the rule. And it's a rule that you can justify from basic electrostatics or basic electromagnetism. So, so these are the two conditions we have to meet simultaneously. Simultaneously we have to be able to say that um, we have to be able to set the wavelength is shorter here. And where the wave fronts join at the surface, they join. They are not discontinuous. And the picture that you draw on here is the only way to meet both the requirements simultaneously. Um, so uh, because if you say as the light comes in, it bends. Now you can draw this. Now you can draw this wave front with a visibly shorter wavelength, but because it's at a shallower angle, by the time they come to join here, they join in a way that they are not discontinuous. So now that you have this picture, now you can figure out Snell's law. Or at least you're supposed to be able to figure out Snell's law. <laughs> Let me see if I can. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. I think these two labels are supposed to be useful. So T is the period. Um, v times T, that gives you the wavelength. All right. Um, I feel like what I should use is, I feel like what I should be able to use is, uh, sorry, I didn't work this out beforehand. So this is the segment that both the sides share, right? So I think I need to be able to set this segment represented using the quantities here is equal to this segment represented using the quantities here. Um, so let's try that. And I, happen, so I do know the uh, quantities that I'm eventually going to use. So this is the angle theta 1. This is the angle, oh wait, they already labeled it. Why is it so far? Um, well, this is angle theta 2. I'll use this. All right. Um, so this is, 
you use a geometry more in this class in any of the other physics classes. Uh, geometric optics, <laughs> we call it geometric optics for a reason. You're gonna be using geometry more. So um, if you go back to doing geometry, um, by the way, this is, I find it difficult to teach geometry. There is no systematic way to do it. You just keep drawing auxiliary figures. You keep labeling things until you figure something out. <laughs> and uh, I think that's the only way I've been able to approach geometry, and that's, that's what I recommend. Um, so you know, I'm just going to keep labeling things until things start to make some sense. Um, let's see. So what I do know is that this should be perpendicular because um, because it's a wave propagation direction and the wave front. They are always drawn perpendicular. Hmm. That means this angle here is 90 degree minus theta 2, right? Oh, 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 I know this is also perpendicular. <laughs> so <laughs> that must mean this is theta 2. Yeah? OK, I got theta 2 in the triangle that I kind of wanted it to be at. Yeah? Uh, and I need to get theta 1 where I want it to be at. I guess I can go through something similar. Let me do it in different colors so that it's less confusing. This angle is 90 degrees minus theta 1. Right? Oh, I think this is a right triangle. Uh, yeah, yeah it's a, this is a right triangle as in this is 90 degrees. So this plus that is 90 degrees, meaning this angle here is theta 1. Everyone good? OK, I think I actually have everything now. So um, for this right triangle here, I know this leg. That's a v, uh, V1t. So, and I know one angle here. So I can express the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse here is, um, so this is the opposite side over hypotenuse. So let me write it down the way. So opposite side, V1t over the hypotenuse. Let me call it capital H is equal to sine of theta 1. Let me write down a similar expression for um, the other right triangle, or uh, for this right triangle here. So um, wait, is this one adjacent? That does, I don't like that. No, 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 no. Um, so the, the side that I know is this side. It's the opposite to theta 2. Good? So I can say opposite side, V2 over T, V2, sorry, V2 times T over the same hypotenuse. So I'm using the same letter H is equal to sine of theta 2. And this is how you drive Snell's law. Uh, there's one other way to do it, but well, this is one way to do it. So each of these expressions, we are going to solve it for h, the hypotenuse. So this becomes um, v1t over sine theta 1 is the hypotenuse. And this expression becomes the hypotenuse is equal to uh, v2t over sine theta 2. So we just say these two are equal to each other and skip the hypotenuse. Yep. Once you do that, then you can get rid of a lot of arbitrary quantities, like the time period t. Because um, in the end, we want an expression that doesn't depend on frequency or wavelength. So, so far, this is what you have. Uh, V1 over sine theta 1 is equal to V2 over sine theta 2. Then you recall back to the definition of index of refraction. Because when you're talking about the actual speed of light, it's a, such a large quantity that you don't ever really want to be dealing with it all the time. So using this, let me say V1 is equal to C over N1. So I'm going to do the substitution for both of them. So V1 is going to be C over N1. 
and v2 is going to become c over n2. So the, numer the numerators cancel out. It's 1 over this is equal to 1 over that. You could just say the denominators are equal to each other. And you get n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. So that's a one way to explain or drive Snell's law. Um, so rather than leaving this as a phenomenological law, that it's just true, you can actually say, based on enforcing these conditions involving wave propagation that we were talking about, Snell's law is the only way to have propagation of light be consistent with oh, wave propagation. 